Uh, I, uh, I'm going to talk about cochlear implants and uh, some of the stuff that, uh, so the current limitations and some of the stuff we're doing on lab that is trying to understand these limitations and maybe go on to next generation of implants that might that we might be able to get better results with. Um, so I apologize, there's going to be a fair amount of researchy stuff in here, but I don't really apologize because I'm really hoping that some of you will be inspired to, to take up research and become mechanistic clinician scientists, which I think um, we really do need in our specialties, particularly in otology. Um, and not, um, and I think uh, if, you, if you come away with any sense of um, wanting to do more, getting cyber research, that would be, uh, that would be a win for me. Uh, so just to start off by, by uh, saying that the, the work done in this uh, is done by a lot of people uh, in the lab, uh, so some of the PhD students and some of them you might know, uh, Peter is a, uh, is a trainee uh, right now as a Jamil. Um, and they come from a range of different disciplines, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, clinical, molecular biology, uh, and computational modeling. So really, uh, really um, want to highlight that the work is done by the people in the lab. Um, I kind of come up with the ideas and bring the money in and then set them to it, but they really do go get it done. So uh, the other thing I want to say is that some of the research being presented today is uh, not peer reviewed. So I do, if it's going to be recorded, I just want to make sure that people do understand that even though some of it has been published, some of it is in preparation, uh, some of it has not been peer reviewed yet. So uh, talking about cochlear implants, we, I think most people know uh, about them now in your generation anyway. Um, they're the, the first and most advanced neuroprosthetic device. Uh, I estimate about 700,000 cochlear implants users worldwide now. Um, they um, first started in uh, 77, 78. Um, I got involved with them about 1990 uh, um, when I was a resident. Uh, and uh, they've been, um, been around for quite a while now. Uh, and so they're really spectacular. They're life transforming. They, many people achieve near to normal speech understanding quiet. Uh, some, most can use a phone. Uh, some even enjoy music again. Um, and they are a remarkable success story, but they are many limitations, uh, particularly speech and quiet and in, sorry, speech and background noise, things like musical appreciation. Uh, so let's just review how they work a little bit. Uh, so basically what cochlear implants do is they take the incoming sound and then they do a uh, this is a spectrogram of the uh, uh, of the of the frequency, uh, the energy, uh, and, the, and over time. And essentially, they band pass in different frequency regions. Uh, then they extract the envelope, which is which means the the shape of the the modulation of the energy in that band. Uh, and then they fill that band in with um, with basically uh, pulses. Uh, so they extract the envelope with pulses that try and recreate the envelope. So this this envelope will be recreated here with pulses. I hope you can see my arrow. And then they present the, um, uh, the high frequencies to the basal electrodes and low frequencies to the apical electrodes. Uh, and of course, in the cochlea is tonotopically organized. So the basal electrodes are high frequency and the apical electrodes are low frequency. And these electrodes try to present different uh, energies, different bands, anywhere from 12 for Medell to uh, 22 for cochlea uh, devices. And then this generates a neurogram, which is a firing rate inside the nerve, which is then uh, transmit to the brain and decoded. Uh, so the uh, the pitch per perception is, is affected not only by where it's presented, but by the rate of stimulation too. So in the cochlea is not just tonotopicity, it's also the, the, the rate you present that can have an effect. It's very important to understand that what we're trying to do is not stimulate the hair cells, we're stimulating the remaining nerve fibers. Uh, so humans are kind of blessed in a way in that the nerve fibers stay alive even when the hair cells die. So this is from one of our collaborators in Canada, these amazing synchrotron CTs where they've spent a lot of time with Hel Rask Anderson in Sweden, another collaborator, hand segmenting up the, the neural structures, which produces beautiful images. So these are, green is the basal membrane, uh, these are the peripheral processes, and these are the cell bodies in Rosenthal's canal, uh, and these are the central processes. So the cochlear implant goes in here and it doesn't, it doesn't stimulate the hair cells here. It actually stimulates either peripheral processes or more likely most people, because many of these are dead, the central processes or around the, around the uh, Rosenthal's canal. So, uh, but as amazing as they are, and they're great, 
Um, they're not great for everybody. There are a lot of limits to current technology that we can get past easily. Um, for instance, if you look at uh, most of the series that look at outcomes of speech uh, recognition or speech detection, um, show the same kind of distribution, the huge range of outcomes. So some people do very well, a lot of people do quite well, uh, but this huge range of people who don't do, um, who do quite badly and in the middle. So this kind of distribution, why is there such a big distribution? Why doesn't everybody do well with them? Um, essentially, if you look at uh, performance gains in the last 15 years, there's not been a huge improvement last uh, in the last 15, 20 years. At the beginning, when we had different speech coding strategies trying to extract the sound uh, and doing much more efficient coding, we got better and better speech. And uh, we're still using A strategies, we're still using CIS. There's not a huge gain uh, in the last few, in the last decade or two. Um, and if you look at cochlear implant users and you basically switch all the electrodes off and then you turn the electrodes on one by one by one and see what their speech recognition score is, as you turn more and more electrodes off from two to 20, you get an increase in the, in the speech understanding, but it saturates in quiet at about eight to 10 electrodes. As you put in noise, the background noise, you need more electrodes. But basically past about 10 to 15 electrodes, you don't get a huge improvement. Uh, so it's not 22 information channels because when you put more electrodes on, it doesn't really improve the speech. It's even worse with sentences where, which are easy to understand, they saturate even earlier on. So there is not, uh, there's something that definitely is not close to normal hearing and can be improved. Uh, so CI users don't hear anywhere close to normal uh, and they don't, um, they don't do very well in background noise. Uh, and this has not changed in many years. So a large part of the problem uh, is this electroneural interface. So uh, if this is a this is another one of these amazing amazing reconstructions from uh, Sumitz uh, uh, and uh, Hanif and Helga Rask Anderson Howley, uh, this is the same thing we saw before uh, the uh, spiral ganglion in the middle, which doesn't go to the tip of the cochlea. Remember, it just goes the first one point seven five turns. So it stops before the vasal membrane stops. Uh, so this is a medal implant, this blue, and this interface here is a problem because this electro is trying to stimulate these nerve cells here. In between, we have electrolytic fluid that is a good electrical conductor. So when you stimulate this electrode, current can spread up and down, and of course, it's supposed to represent different frequencies. So you're trying to stimulate this electrode to this uh, particular group of neurons but it's also spreading here. And this group of neurons is being stimulated by this electrode here as well. So it's getting double information. And this is really causing a lot of crosstalk and, and blurring or a smearing of the signal. And look at the apex. So all these apical fibers in the cochlea are trying to get to the spiral ganglion and it's all clumped together. So all these frequencies are clumped in a very tight region. And it's very hard to separate these up. And our implants don't actually go that far up anyway. So, uh, so part of the problem is this channel interaction due to current spread. We also have to remember that we're not implanting normal cochleas, we're implanting disease cochleas. So in disease cochleas, there's going to be parts of the, if this is a spiral ganglion, green means that, that they're alive, they're going to be parts where it's dead. So these are, these are dead parts of the cochlea, where there's no nerve fibers. And when we try and stimulate this dead part of the cochlea, we keep pumping up the current in this device, uh, trying to get a, a uh, stimulus, but until we pump it up enough so the current spreads to somewhere neighboring, we, we actually don't get a response. But we're not getting a response from this part. We're getting a response from a neighboring part of the nerves. Uh, and that's also getting stimulated by this electrode. So there's a lot of channel confusion. So this, this combination of current spread and, uh, and uh, neural health uh, makes, makes, the, makes the set up for, for a lot of spectral uh, smearing. So can we manipulate this? Uh, can we manipulate this current? Can we put new kinds of stimulation parameters in here to try and stop that from spreading so much? Can we minimize this current spread, et cetera? Uh, so there's a lot of problems at the, at the machine neural interface with current implants. The current spread means it's very difficult to focus in stimulation. There's dead regions uh, inside the module, there's a loss of frequencies and there's channel confusion from that. And we haven't even talked about insertion trauma. So one half of the problem is that we are trying to get good electrical hearing. The other half of the problem is we're trying not to damage what's left because if we damage what's left, uh, first of all, um, we need that uh, residual hearing as we implant better and better hearing ears 
to actually act with the electrical stimulus because we do we know we know that acoustic hearing is better than electrical hearing for things like timing information we also don't want to get delayed fibrosis and inflammation because we might be coming up with gene therapies and things like that and regeneration and if we damage the heck out of the cochlea uh, we lose that uh, lose the opportunity for the future um, there's the foreign body reactions to having something in the cochlea, which is not native tissue. Uh, there's a poor electrical dynamic range. We go from firing rate of zero to firing rate saturation over only about 10 to 15 dBs, as opposed to acoustically, where we can go about 130 dBs. Uh, the apex is difficult to access, and those apical neurons are clumped together, modulus. Uh, and another important thing is that the cochlear shape is not the same in everybody, nor is it the same size. And so we one size electrode may be under inserted in some patients and over inserted in others. So when we try and space out the frequencies on the electrodes, and we say we're going to put 1000 hertz here and 2000 hertz here and here and here and here, in some patients, uh, those will be spaced out where the natural tonotopic organization was when they had already had experience with sound, they will have, have had a natural map built in. In other patients, it won't. So uh, one way to demonstrate this current, this problem uh, with uh, cochlear implants, the amount of channel interaction is to look at this experiment where we just took um, speech and we bandpass filtered in the software. And then we basically put it through 16 different bands to simulate an advanced bionics electrode. And we can see uh, basically what we're doing is what, what this is, this is a confusion matrix to say how much mutual information is there between this channel and this channel. So of course, along the diagonal, it's the same channel, but there's not much mutual information between this channel and this channel because uh, it's relatively blue. And as you get close and closer, there's more and more interaction. This channel has some mutual information with that channel five and six because they're close together. Once we put it through the, the processing of the cochlear uh, implant device, which we can do with something called load board. So it processes it exactly the same as a cochlear implant would, but instead of putting it to electrodes, it puts down these pins, which we would have off. We see much more uh, interaction between the different channels. And then we put it through an artificial cochlear uh, where we basically put in saline and measure the, the voltage of different channels that, that comes out these channels through the same electrodogram. And we get huge amounts of mutual information. It's amazing that you can detect anything from that. So how do we try and understand these, these kinds of uh, uh, um, electroneural interfaces and try and so we can have a model try and improve them for the future because we can't really access them in living patients very easily. So there's a few things we can do that we have been doing. Uh, we can use a back telemetry from implants in living patients. Uh, so the implants themselves these days are quite clever. They can tell us a little bit about what's going on in that interface. We can measure the impedance to ground. We can measure something called a transimpedance matrix, which is how much it's a kind of a, a measure of currents, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, we can measure neural responses. Uh, that's to say we can stimulate the uh, nerve fibers and look at the responses. Uh, we can build physical models of the cochlea, and I'll talk about some of these. Uh, we can build li simple linear models. We can build complex spiral models, and we can use cadaveric models, and then we can use computational models. Uh, we can use simple models, lump parameter, or, or finite element models to try to actually recreate. Um, in by, by replacing the cochlear geometry, very tiny little bits uh, of, um, of space that, that uh, work together trying to understand how current flows in there. Uh, so one of the first things we have to do if you're going to build models, understand uh, how, the, um, how the human cochlea uh, works as a, as a sort of, a, what is this resistance or impedance when you put electrical stimulation in? And this is, a, this is some work we did um, we looked at uh, fresh frozen cadavers, we put the implants in, we actually had taken the, uh, the processor off and the, the pins out, so all the, all the wires were, were taken out into, instead of going to a processor, on, on wires that we could tap, and then we can put sine waves in, and then we can put a frequency sweep from 10 hertz to 100 kilohertz, and measure the frequency response of the cochlear implant. Uh, inside the, uh, that, that's basically what's the impedance between the implant inside the cochlea and the ground electrode. Uh, this is the phase, for those of you who, who understand a little bit about phase and impedance, this is the amplitude of impedance. Um, and basically, we see this low frequency region, actually, this is interesting because sometimes what we find is that we, don't, we can't get to the bottom why somebody's not doing very well, or they're popping in, or they or they uh, implants popping in and out. Sometimes it's a ground electrode problem, which are very difficult to troubleshoot. 
and we think this very low frequency region here is dominated by a ground electrode. This could be a way to interrogate that. And we can, once we define this, we have to try and build uh, our models so they can they look like this electrically. Another thing we can use is something called transimpedance matrix measurements from patients. So when you inject a, a, a a couple of implants are something called current sources. So they will keep bumping up the voltage until they deliver the current you set. So uh, you set a certain amount of current, you say, this is the current I want, and then they keep, they'll deliver that current um, up until they reach a voltage compliance level, of course. But uh, uh, so you put this current in this electrode and it generates the voltage between the ground electrode and, 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 this, uh, and, this, uh, and this current source, this particular electrode. Then, but also because current spreads other directions up and down the cochlea, then they'll also generate uh, a, a voltage between this electrode and the ground, this electrode and ground, and this electrode and ground. And this is an indirect measure of the current spread. In fact, we don't get a good measure of the actual impedance of this stimulating electrode because at the electro electro interface, there's lots of polarization effects. But here, there's no current flow. So we can get a good measure of the impedance of the remaining electrodes. So we can plot this profile of the voltage that's induced at the other electrodes. And then we can still make the next one and measure that voltage profile. And we get something called transimpedance matrix, which tells a little bit about how much voltage is induced on the, on the electrodes. Um, this is what it looks like with an AB device. So that you're stimulating, for instance, this electrode. This electrode here in the black is how much the, uh, essentially what voltage is induced on the other, other electrodes. This is what it looks like on a cochlear device. They call it TIMS. Um, Transimpedance matrix, AB calls it electric field imaging, uh, and you can make a heat map of this as well, which make it a bit easier to understand sometimes. So we have built a few different models. The first one, and perhaps uh, a very useful one, is that we built a simple linear model, it's like unwrapping the cochlea as you take the coil, make it a straight line, uh, and then we made the same size as the uh, as the cochlea. So this basal lumens the same size as a, as a real human cochlear lumen based on micro CT scanning. And it's the same length as a real cochlea, about uh, 34 millimeters. And the apex is the same size as the apex. Uh, and then uh, this is, we 3D print this out of, out of, uh, out of Silastic. And then we put recording wires uh, to measure the voltage along here objectively. And these are roughly the location of how far away the spiral ganglion cells would be the Rosenthal's canal from, from the center of the lumen. Um, of course, this is a silicone-based uh, implant, so we can't really uh, compare this to cochlear, which has conduction, uh, you know, which is not, uh, which is, this is highly insulating. Uh, and so we put resistors across this lumen here to saline on the outside to make current spread across the lumen here, like it would in a real cochlear. Uh, and then we can change the values of resistors so we can match the patient EFI. This is real patient EFI, is electric field imaging measured inside human cochleas. We just keep tuning the resistors till we can match this. And then we can sort of have a sense that we have the same electrical um, characteristics as, as, as bony cochlea. Um, we can model this using uh, uh, spinal element modeling, which we, we talked about slightly, where we put a physics model. We actually uh, recreate um, this, uh, this shape uh, uh, with um, hundreds of thousands of individual elements, and we can measure the current spread in those elements. Uh, and then we compare. Does it make much of a difference when you make a spiral or a linear cochlear? And they more or less fall on top of each other. It doesn't make a huge difference to the to the voltage inside the uh, the implant when you put a when you put a implant in this or that. But what we miss here, of course, is a cross turn stimulation because in a cochlear, if you keep pumping over the voltage, not only will it induce a current here, it will jump across the next turn. You get cross turn stimulation, and we won't see that in this kind of model. So we've made these linear cochlear models like this, uh, where we can measure the voltage along these 14 wires, and we can use them to understand current spread and things like that, and I'll talk about that. We can also 3D print these models. Uh, now we can. Uh, it took us a while to build a 3D print at this kind of resolution, really at the limits of current 3D printing uh, resolution. Um, and so this is from one of our collaborators in Cambridge showing even in eight temporal bones has a huge amount of variation in the shape and the size of the cochlea. So we want to look at how do different shapes and sizes of cochlea interact with the cochlear implant because not all going to be the same. So we basically uh, segment the cochlea uh, and then we make a CAD file and we can 3D print it. And this just shows that we get pretty good resolution. This is a micro CT of our model compared to the original micro CT of the temporal bone we based it on. 
and very good uh, correlation between the two. So when we do that, we can start to look at more sophisticated models and we can start to put in wires in the, inside the lumen where the, where the nerves would sit. And we can start to put these uh, micro wires in here. And this is one, one such model which we've made uh, with micro wires embedded inside here. And actually this looks nicer than it really is because the micro wires don't go quite to the end, but we can still sense the voltage along here. So we haven't done um, any recordings with this yet. We just made this in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, however, in the real cochleas, the, 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 um, so these are made out of, out of, uh, of all kinds of PDMS fibers, which are insulating plastics. Uh, we need to put pores in there to make it look like bone, because really uh, what happens in, in the cochlea is that the current spread is through ionic conduction, uh, whereas we're looking at uh, through wires, it's something called phoradic conduction. So we need to put pores in there, so current can spread through micro pores or micro solid uh, electrolyte spaces. And we start to do that now. So we've started to be able to actually print micro pores inside the cochlea. This just shows we inject green dye into the pores. It does spread out into the, into the lumen. So these pores are connected to lumen. So now we're starting to get more and more realistic electrical milieu uh, that looks like a real cochlea. Um, so we can also make, so one of the things that you can, you can spend, I mean, making one of those 3D printed cochleas takes a long time um, if you want high resolution. So we have to think about what is it we want to explore. And a very good way to do that is to make some models and try and understand what things are important uh, to try and explore. So we've been building these final element models um, to see what's worth exploring. And also we can measure things, a final element model we can't measure in real life. We can measure things like current in different parts we can't reach in the, in the physical model. Uh, we can't actually measure current without drawing current and that changes the current. So we can't actually really, really measure current without changing the system in real life. Whereas in the models, we can measure the current without doing any of that kind of thing. So this is, um, this is something, uh, these are the kind of models we're building, these 3D parametric models, not exactly uh, based on CT scans, but close. Uh, and uh, we, we mesh this up in tiny little bits. And if you inject current here, this, this element here interacts with the next element, which impacts the next element. Um, it takes a long time to calculate all this, but then it can, you can get the current spread and, and uh, profile along the cochlea. Now, models um, are only as good as, as what you put into them. You can assign any kind of different values to this and get any, any result you want. So you have to be careful that you that you make your models with realistic parameters. They say uh, the everybody loves a model except the person who made it because they, they know what shortcuts they took. So we've been trying to validate these models with those electric field imaging measured in real cochleas I talked about earlier. These are from two patients uh, uh, measured uh, by one of our uh, MRC unit in Cambridge here. Uh, and this is our model output. This is the patient output. So we're trying to match what we find in patients. And in the models, we can start to measure voltage profiles along the spiral, we can measure current and electric field and things like that, which we can't measure in real life very easily. We can even then measure what the voltage would be at the first node of rhombia, where we think it, the nerve gets activated. Um, and this is a model of, of the voltage that's sensed at the first node of Rhombia at the apex versus the base. What's very interesting is that the voltage at the apex is more than the base because uh, the, the cochlea is a bit narrow at the apex. It, it is quite a bit narrow. And that means there's less current spread because there's less charged particles to, to dissipate current. So you end up with a higher voltage. And, and that is kind of interesting in itself. Um, so. When we get that, then we can start to put in nerve fibers into it. So we can, we can start to put perfect. So we could put these nerve fibers in here with central axons, nerve bodies, and peripheral uh, axons. And uh, we can we can sample then the voltage along these nerve fibers. It takes this actually has been months of work for for Tim and anyone two postdocs in the lab. Um, it's not easy to do this, and it really makes you think about what's important inside the cochlea. Because one of the things that's really starting to come hit us is that. Uh, the neurons respond to something called the uh, activating function, which is <clears throat> how fast the how fast the voltage drops across space. Actually, the second derivative of of the of the of the voltage versus space functions. Um, so, um, so basically, it means that if the voltage changes very very rapidly, then it's likely to activate a neuron. But if these neurons are are curving at, at here they're crossing a lot of field lines very rapidly. So they're very likely to get activated at the curving point because they're crossing a lot of field lines. So if the anatomy of the, of the axon is that it curves here, it's likely to get activated here. If it comes out here and curves here, 
it's like to get activated here. If, if it turns and then curves, it's like to get activated at turning points because it's crossing a lot of field lines. So it becomes really important to become understand the anatomy of the uh, uh, of the cochlea to try and figure that out. Uh, and uh, Chloe, who's just joined our lab, you might know her as ne another um, ENT uh, registrar, um, is going to work a lot in trying to trying to make micro CT staining techniques to try and measure the uh, exact anatomy of these uh, dendrites and these uh, central axons. Uh, but within the model, we can start to then put in um, put in things like we can see we can put in the voltage and see does the peripheral process get activated or the central process. And we find interesting things that that are, um, um, that are that we do actually line up with what other people have found to some extent, which is that the peripheral processes prefer a cathodic stimulation and the central processes prefer anodic stimulation, just because of the orientation of the fibers relative to the field. It's not that they're different in their behavior, but the current enters and leaves a different direction in in this orientation than this orientation. Uh, and uh, then we can we can build these maps of if you were to stimulate with a nodic pulse and the peripheral and central get stimulated about the same time. And so this the peripheral process gets stimulated and, the, and this has already been stimulated centrally. But if you do a cathodic pulse, then the peripheral process gets stimulated first, then it, it, the pulse runs along here, then it gets stopped at the soma cell body because of the delay there, and then it carries on the central process. So these are all, these are all simulations. So I don't, uh, I mean, these are what we think are going on. But what's really interesting is that we want to build a platform so we can develop next generation technologies. So what we're trying to do is take this uh, speech, uh, do, our, do the processing that cochlear implant does, the FFT, take out the frequency bands, and then we just take that part and pipe it out, put it through a machine learning paradigm, uh, <clears throat> something called automatic speech recognition engine. And if there's information there, this speech recognition engine should be able to extract that into speech. So if we put in, we train this on a four, I think it's 4,000 timid database sentences. So we know what the original speech is. And then we, we take out the voltage, uh, the uh, signals at each band, feed into the speech language into our uh, machine learning algorithm, see what percentage gets right. Then we put it through our coding algorithm, whether it's, uh, it's, whether it's uh, continuous interleaved sampling or ACE or whatever you, your implant wants to use to code the speech. We take out the voltage it puts to the uh, electrodes uh, and then we put that through machine learning and train it and see what percentage it can understand just from the elect electrodogram, so-called. And then we put it through a current model into our, our console model. Uh, then we measure the currents, but measure the voltage at this interface where the nerves would be, put that through there. And we want to know where's the, where's the information being dropped? Is it being dropped at this interface, this interface, this interface, or this interface? And then we can put it through our neuron model, which is a separate model we build of how neurons behave. We try to take this voltage and we built a model that tries to understand how neurons will fire uh, for a given voltage. Uh, and we take this, this and then we feed it to the machine learning algorithm and see how much it understands based on that. And using these kinds of uh, techniques, uh, we, start to get, we start to get some sense of, um, of where a lot of a dropage is. So, so you know, we, the machine learning algorithm can understand almost 80% of speech is from the spectrogram. Electrogram does quite well, even at the current spread, it does quite well. Uh, this is a bit artificially raised because there's no noise in this system. In real life, it's going to be noise. Um, in a the neurogram, then it drops again. So we can then try different coding strategies. We can try, uh, we can try CIS or new coding strategies and see, see if, if information is preserved uh, or not. And we can try putting electrodes closer to the modules and further away from modules. Uh, we can build dead regions in here. So this is a kind of a platform as we refine it will let us understand where the, where the problems are. Um, and the other part I'm not going to talk about, we have a whole other talk on insertion trauma, is can we understand where the, where the cochlear forces are as it touches the implant so we can stop damaging the implant. And after a lot of trial and error, we, we developed a process that makes very clear uh, cochlear so we can actually put the implant in and see where it's sitting and we can measure um, we can actually see exactly where it sits and where it touches as it goes in. Uh, this is the next generation of that. Actually, we've put uh, lots of viewing portals. We've bought a micro camera. It's only half a millimeter wide. Actually, sorry, about 7.7 millimeters wide. And it can go in these portals and really examine carefully how the implant touches and where it touches. So how can we improve the specificity of uh, uh, stimulation? Can we change electro design? Uh, can we change the stimulation mode? Uh, that means can we do uh, can we use 
different kinds of uh, uh, electrical stimulation? Can we change electrical position? Can we just turn off electrodes that are not that are over dead regions of cochlea and improve our cells? Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, some of these one by one. Uh, in simulations in our FEM model, we find that for monopolar stimulation, which is we, we put electrode inside the cochlea and all the voltage goes to the, the ground electrode, which is underneath the temporalis muscle over here somewhere. Uh, so there's, a, there's quite a broad stimulation. Then basically you get the same voltage across the whole lumen of the cochlea. Uh, it doesn't really matter where you put the implant. You get the same uh, voltage across the whole lumen because monopolar stimulation is quite broad stimulation. We tend to use monopolar stimulation almost all the time. Uh, how about changing the electrode size or design? So we can simulate making the electrode bigger or smaller, and we find almost no difference in, in the voltage profiles across the lumen when we, when we make them uh, up to uh, 0.05, like more than one order of magnitude bigger, almost the same. So it's not dominated by the size of the electrode, it's dominated by the current spread inside the cochlear fluids. What about if you change electro design? So we've, we've basically taken uh, four different companies, electrodes, Medel, Oticon, AB, and Cochlear, put them inside our plastic cochlea. We measure the, the impedance spectroscopy, the, how, the basic impedance of these different four different kinds of electrodes, and they all fall basically bang on top of each other. So there's almost no difference uh, in the voltage profile they generate, even though they're very different. These are ring electrodes, these are uh, recessed, these are half electrodes. Uh, so we can't solve this problem by electro design. We can solve impedance problems and power consumption problems, but we can't solve this electro spread problem very easily by, by electro design. This just shows that, uh, that uh, again, that the impedance profile, the uh, voltage generated by all three electrodes falls bang on top of each other. So even orientation, so we, you know, even if you spin the electrode 180 degrees and we measure the voltage uh, along the side of our plastic cochlea and we spin it 180 degrees, it's almost the same. So this is green, it's spun 180 degrees, uh, red is the original. So it doesn't really matter to some extent if our electrodes facing the uh, uh, spiral ganglia or not, because the voltage that, that is sensed is almost the same for monopolar stimulation. Uh, so surgical point, so orientation is not that important. Although, of course, it is for trauma, if you don't want to put the curved end up against the vasal membrane, you have to keep shoving there. But uh, So how about stimulation mode? So usually we can we can we focus the current? You know, we we use monopolar, so we put the this is red is where we inject the current, ground is where we suck it out. Uh, so right now we use monopolar. Most people use monopolar almost exclusively, uh, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes. Um, and we can also do other things. We can put in bipolar. We can put the current in this electrode, suck it out either apically or basally, uh, either one electrode away BP plus uh, plus zero, two electrodes away BP plus one. Etc. We can put tripolar in. So this is interesting, isn't it? We can put the current in here and suck out half on either side and really try and focus this so the current doesn't go past there because we're sucking it out right next to it in both sides. And we use mixtures of, of tripolar and monopolar as well. So we tested all these in our, in our linear model here, plastic model. Uh, this is a current spread by stimulating electrode 8 uh, using monopolar. Uh, and you can see it's quite a widespread, but we get a lot of voltage where the nerve fibers would sit. Uh, when we used, I forget about this purple for now, when we use tripolar or mono bipolar, we get nowhere near the same voltage because the current is being sucked, uh, is being injected and sucked quite locally, and it doesn't even make it out as far as, as, the, as the lumen, uh, with past lumen. So we, we can't get that kind of voltage. We can focus it, tripolar, if you, if you normalize it, tripolar is quite focused, but it's very low, uh, there's very low voltage there. So we'd have to really pump up this, uh, this current to generate the same kind of loudness as monopolar. And by that time, we're getting more and more spread because as you pump this up, you get more spread and the power requirements go way up. So it's not, it's, that's not an easy solution for us either. Bipolar, I won't even talk about. It's a really crap stimulus. Uh, it's very asymmetric because the, the apical part of the cochlea is narrower than the basal. So you get this, and so there's less current, you get this very asymmetric profiles and you don't stimulate what you think you're stimulating. So almost everybody's given up with bipolar stimulation for, for a reason. Um, the uh, tripolar is interesting because it is symmetrical. So these are some simulations showing from going from completely monopolar to completely tripolar, uh, what the voltage profile is on the neural plane in the cochlea. These are the console modeling. You can see as you go from completely monopolar, completely tripolar, 
it gets more focused, but it gets much smaller and smaller. The, um, and this is this is just a cross section showing it gets more focused, but gets much smaller. So it can just show the same thing in a model. We've measured it in one uh, cochlear energy in two. Uh, we put electrode in the modiolus and put electrode in and used monopolar stimulation, which is tripolar, much bigger, similar to our plastic cochlear in our modeling, uh, almost a uh, 20 dB drop in, in voltage measured uh, when we use tripolar versus monopolar. Uh, we, so we can put this into our models and see how many neurons will be activated if we use monopolar versus tripolar. Um, so with the monopolar, it's this broad spread of neural activation as we increase the current from here to here, you, get, you recruit more and more neurons. Monopolar, it is more focused, but you recruit very few neurons. This is not going to be as loud as this. So we're going to have to increase that current to make the current, make the loudness similar, which we, we give a lot of, um, give up a lot. And we've done some experiments in patients to at least Francois, our collaborator in Bob Carline's lab has. Uh, and uh, he finds about 10, 10 dB difference in loudness for the same current between tripolar and monopolar, which is close to what we measure in, a, in, a, in our model, actually. So what about electro position? Can we put the electrodes? So right now, they come in two flavors. They come in lateral wall. That means they hug the outer wall, close to the stria vascularis here. This is the osteospiral lamina and basal membrane. This is the medial wall. This is where the nerve cell sits, spiral ganglia and Rosenthal's canal, uh, scala distal B, scala tympani. Uh, so um, normally the, the lateral wall electrodes sit over here, like the medella electrode, the slim straight, and the slim J from, from uh, cochlear and from AB. Uh, you get this perimodial electrodes, like the 532 from cochlear. Uh, and in between these two, a little bit more perimodial, is something called the mid scala from advanced bionics. Um, and uh, this mid scala is supposed to give you advantages of both, uh, not touching anything, so it doesn't damage anything. In general, we find we lose hearing more often the premodular than lateral wall electrodes, so we, we preserve hearing less often. But there's some theoretical advantage in premodular because it's closer to the spiral ganglia cells, so you should be able to focus stimulation better theoretically, uh, and you might need less power because it's closer to the spiral ganglia cells. But more, they're hard to put in, hard to design because they have precurved stylets or various other things that damage your cochlea in the way in. So when we, when we use monopolar stimulation, which is broad stimulation, we find in our models, whether you put lateral wall, mid scala, primordial, the activation on the neural plane is almost exactly the same. Uh, and which is interesting because nobody, that's pretty well fits with the clinical findings that there's no difference in outcome uh, in the speech recognition of these three types of implants. And this is our own data using from, from three different uh, sites, from our site, Cambridge St. George's, RNAT, we're in about 200, I think, I forget, 250 or something patients. We looked at speech outcomes uh, using comparing Slim J, lateral wall electrode, with uh, mid scala, more perimodial, um, and in, in BKB, in male quiet, female quiet, in noise, male and female noise. They're almost exactly the same. So we see no difference either. Uh, but interestingly enough, if you, we can simulate putting in tripolar stimulation, uh, and here we find this difference. So when we put lateral wall tripolar, we get very little stimulation. Uh, in, when we put the perimodial, we can focus it and, and get much better um, and get much better stimulation. So it might make a difference on tripolar, but there is no current clinical strategy that uses tripolar stimulation with perimodial electrodes. Um, what about just turning off electrodes that are over poor that are, we think of the poor parts of the cochlea, not hearing very well, have dead regions. Well, first of all, it's very hard for us to measure dead regions, although we're working on it with a collaborator, Bob, Bob Carlion. Um, uh, okay, uh, so, um, hmm, okay, I've got out of sequence here a little bit. Uh, so one of the things that we, we are trying to do is simulate real world data. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but basically we're trying to recreate these classic experiments where we, Turn up, uh, we turn on uh, four, uh, eight, uh, 12, or more and more electrons, see how much your speech recognition increases. So, in our models, when we put this through the machine learning paradigm, uh, if we train it on four electrodes and turn on four, it does quite well. Uh, if we train it on 20 and, and give it 20, it does quite well. But if you train it on 20 electrodes, which is normal people who've been hearing before would, and we give it four, it does poorly. Uh, and if you, if you train 20, give it eight, does poorly. Uh, but if you give it 20 and train 20, does quite well. So this is data from eight, from eight subjects from this study by, uh, by schwartz Lazak using a TIMIT database, same one we trained our, uh, our, our models on. And as, 
as you can see, in their black, as they turn more and more electrodes, it kind of saturates about 15, 16 electrodes, and they don't get any better speech understanding. And the mean of our two training paradigms, it falls pretty close to that. So um, we, we are, are we, this is encouraging for us that we are on the right track. We, we start, we, our data is simulating what people are finding real patients. We've tried in our models in just turning off electrodes uh, in regions where we can simulate dead regions. So we can say, we're going to just turn off on neurons in this region and we're going to reassign, turn and we're going to uh, reassign. Uh, so this region, either narrow or wide regions of the cochlea are going to have dead neurons. And uh, so we're going to put the electrodes in and we're going to just use a normal strategy or we're going to turn those electrodes facing those neurons off so they're not so they're not uh, taking that frequency that's not getting anywhere because those neurons are dead and reassigned to other electrodes. And so we can use this site selection strategy where we do the best thing knowing where, where, knowing where dead regions are in the model versus not doing the best thing and then putting it through machine learning. And we find very little difference uh, by doing that either in, in background noise, we find slight difference. And this again is in keeping lots of studies showing that turning off electrodes uh, over dead regions doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. So what can we do? Uh, I think the future is not electrical. Um, so we need to find better forms of stimulation, allow better focusing. Um, so this is a paper in, in Nature Communication 2019, looking at optogenetics uh, in, I think it's in gerbils, uh, measuring from the inferior colliculus. Uh, and this is uh, uh, acoustic stimulation, I think here. Uh, and you get very narrow stimulation acoustically. When you use something called optogenetic stimulation, what that means is you've transfected the spiral ganglion cells or rhodopsin in response to light. Then you stimulate them with a very narrow laser pulse. And then that doesn't spread very much because the laser pulse doesn't spread like current, electrical current does. And you get very narrow stimulation again. Electrical stimulation gives you wide, quite wide stimulation. Uh, but I have to say that acoustic stimulation, uh, it doesn't, it's not as loud with the, with the laser stimulation as it is with acoustic stimulation. And we don't have any chronic models of this. So what happens when you get scarring that scatters light and things like that? Uh, but it already, this is a, there's an inkling towards we other other te technologies that might be able to focus stimulation better. We can, for instance, put thermal genes in there, respond to uh, to heat, and use infrared light. And people have played with that. Uh, they're not so affected by by scattering by scarring. We can put. Uh, nanoparticles inside these uh, spiral ganglion cells and, and they can stimulate the, the, these nanoparticles, optical or ultrasound stimulation, which will depolarize them. We can use pressure sensor genes inside these and use ultrasound. We can use electrons to go inside the nerve itself and some people are playing with that. So you don't have this, you have this gapless junction so can, there's no current spread because of the electrons touching the nerve. Uh, or we can use neuro, neurotrophins bring the nerve fibers to the electrode, try and get, try and get this gapless junction. And this is, we're playing with some of this. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, a microelectrode array that we, um, uh, this uh, microelectrode that, that we simulate, we put uh, otic, uh, actually spiral ganglion cells from human stem cells that we try to transdifferentiate into spiral ganglion cells uh, onto this microelectrode array. And they're growing on this, uh, on this microelectrode as so we measure electrical activity. And just, just on Monday, we were able to actually measure spiking potentials from these uh, st uh, human stem cells. Uh, and so we, we can now play with things like, um, with this model, we can play with things like what kind of stimulation do they best respond to? But more importantly, we can play with different kinds of uh, energies like lasers and thermogenetics and things like that. Uh, and even more importantly for us is that if we have patients who have, uh, for instance, problems with the, uh, a neurogenic problem for the hearing loss, like OPA1, et cetera, we can take stem cells from those patients from white cells, grow their stem cells, and put them on this kind of microelectrode array and then try and transfect them with various kinds of genes or therapies. See, can we restore the function in these particular, this particular person's stem cells, knowing the genetic defect on, on an in vivo model, which we can then use to take back to the process of personalized medicine. So we, then let's, uh, let's see what we can do with back telemetry. We talked before about the electro impedance interface, EFI imaging, uh, which is that voltage induced on all the other currents, current electrodes when you stimulate one. Uh, we've been using this a lot recently to try and detect extra cochlear electrodes because sometimes when you put electrodes into the cochlea, they slip out a bit. Uh, and that is often undetected and they cause problems because people are programming them as if they have frequencies assigned to them, but they're not getting to the ear. Uh, and uh, 
So either they're not fully inserted or because they slip out post implantation, that could be um, anywhere from about 15. I think in our series is more like 25% of them had at least one electrode extracochlear. Most of them you can't identify during surgery by mapping electrical responses. So this is just one of our clear cochlear showing when you put an electrode in, uh, because it's got a memory, uh, let's see, see, because it's got a memory and it wants to straighten up again, once you put it in and you release, uh, uh, you can see it starts to uncurl a little bit. So this is tendency to uncoil and come out the cochlea. So this is probably what causes these to, to between the end of putting it in and sewing up the, the patient's head, uh, some electrodes might slip out. Uh, so um, we've been using this transmitting matrix to see, can we detect that? And essentially what you get is in all three devices, you get this, if electrodes slip out, you get this collapse in the transmitting matrix because these electrodes are sitting in saline or blood. So they're very conductive, so they can't generate a voltage. The ones inside the cochlea are sitting in, in cochlear fluid and are, um, there's only so many charge carriers there. So they actually generate a voltage. Look at this stop. These three are outside uh, the cochlea. These three are outside the cochlea. We can, we can see that. And in cadaveric models, I won't go into details, but we can detect almost, in eight cad cadavers, we detect almost all the time if electrodes are out using EFI. Uh, and we've done this interoperatively with AB electrodes. We put it, we took out four electrodes, uh, various number of electrodes. We could see this collapse in the function and accurately detect how many electrodes are out. And we use this interoperably quite a bit now. So here's a, here's a case, uh, I think I was doing this one. Uh, and at the end of surgery, the impedances are normal, uh, but this doesn't look right. These three look like they, they, they've collapsed. So I opened up the skin again, and yes, three electrodes are out, pushed them back in, and now we get a nice EFI with no collapses at this end. Another case uh, with a cochlear device, um, open up the ear, these, these look like they're out. They were sure enough, three or four electrodes are out. Uh, and then we push it back in again. This is the post-op extraction. And then we get a nice, re re nice return of our EFI. Um, we can also tell TIPO fold over with these because if electrodes curve over, this electrode is touching this electrode. So these two have a very similar impedance. We get this typical pattern of this electrode and this electrode having the same impedance. So we can, we can uh, this is a patient who had a a severe facial nerve stimulation. Every time we, we stimulate the mid part of the cochlea and we see this dip in, in the EFI profile, like we see a current, that to us, to us means there's a current shunt out of there. And I looked at the CT scan. I think she's got a geniculate cochlear uh, dehiscence. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, that, and so the current is going straight from the cochlea to the facial nerve. Talking about facial nerve, we've also been measuring where the current spreads to the facial nerve uh, in cadavers uh, and making maps of the voltage of the facial. I'm not going to talk, and that's a whole different project that Simone is doing. Uh, but we have been. Um, we have been doing a lot of stuff with because half, I run this clinic of patients who are really struggling with the cochlear implants uh, and with Bob, who's a scientist. And we, half the patients we see can't use the implant because there's so much facial nerve stimulation. Uh, and we've tried all kinds of things, but we also, so in conclusions, uh, our current cochlear implants uh, um, use cochlear, probably an interim solution, electroscalation. We're unlikely to be using the same technology, I think in 10 years time. Uh, much more diagnostic information can we, we, can, we can use derived from cochlear implants using the back telemetry that we're currently using. And we really should be using things like EFIs a lot more. Uh, um, and they can tell us about the health of the cochlear, electrical environment, and device function. And we're actually growing fibrocytes now on cochlear implants in situ and seeing if we can detect fibrosis by changing in, in the complex impedance. And Simone, uh, one of the, anyone in our, in our lab are doing that. Uh, so we can recapitulate what's going inside the cochlea from the back measurements. Uh, we really don't know how different structures respond to different kinds of pulses. We think the auditory nerve and the facial nerve are different in their response uh, profiles, and we can use that to try and focus one structure versus another. Um, and I think hearing and preservation balance are likely to involve biological therapies, uh, as well as changing electrical designs. So we're going to have things like steroid looting drugs and things like that. But we also want to use biological therapies to try and try and get the neurons to grow to the implant. Uh, and we're playing with some of this stuff as well. So, but it's not all about this interface. So we've got, a, I've only covered half the equation. Uh, so there's a lot of top-down neuro-linguistic processes, neurocognitive skills, social and personal motivation factors that, that achieve the outcome, the cortical factors, uh, rehabilitation, cortical plasticity. There's a whole other area of research that uh, Debbie uh, in our lab is more, uh, well, not in our lab, in her own lab, 
uh, at Cambridge is, is working on. Uh, and uh, those are equally important. And those are neural processes that are about rehabilitation and retrain the synaptic uh, wiring in the brain. Uh, so um, this is the, the clinic that we run, the Cambridge Hearing Implant Diagnostic Optimization Clinic, where we see patients who are struggling with implants. And so hopefully some of these techniques we can start to apply them. Uh, these are people who fund, fund this. I've been, I've been here three years and been lucky to get some of this funding from various granting agencies. Uh, again, I uh, really want to acknowledge the people in the lab who did most of the work. Um, and uh, um, that's it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Prof, for a really fascinating talk. Um, so if I can I just ask people to submit their questions via the chat function. So we've had a, uh, a few questions through Prof uh, for you. So one was just about... Um, the computational models that you talked about. Um, so can you just kind of, I guess, in briefly tell us what are the principles of these models and also how do you validate them? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, validation is always the key with those models. Uh, so maybe I'll just go back to screen share and show that, uh, um, show one of them just to show how it works a bit more. Um, so basically what you, what you have to do is you have to draw the anatomy that you want and then you divide the anatomy into very small segments. So you, you divide it into you know, millions, well, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of these, these mesh small cubes. Each one of these gets, gets ascribed a uh, impedance and, and a certain kind of behavior. Um, and then basically what you do is when you stimulate, when this, so you look at what happens at all of these different subsections when you, when you put a current in here. So this, this, uh, uh, this little segment will then talk to the next segment, which will then talk to the next segment. So each one cascade and talk to the one next to it. So you can see what happens throughout the structure as each in individual element interacts with each other individual element. So you're quite right. We have to validate these and we try and validate them in two ways. Uh, one, is, uh, one is we try and take the structure, we try and take the measurements for the impedance that are measured from the literature for bone and things like that. Cochlear bone hasn't really been measured very much. We're using things like um, things like cortical bone um, uh, um, from femur and things like that. Uh, we know that we know the impedance of, of paralymph more or less same as saline. We you know so you take structure take these measurements from various uh, published um, measurements people have done. And then the second way we measure in, to, uh, second way we validate them is that when we inject current here, we should get the same transimpedance matrix we measure in real living patients which is I, sh I showed you here, I think. Um, and this is our model in blue, and this is two living patients. And we, we do get the same kind of, um, same kind of uh, impedance profile. But it's really important that you don't, that you don't just tune it to, to fit one set of data. Should, you should tune it once, and then it should fit a whole bunch of different data. Otherwise, you just, uh, you're just you know, cherry picking your model. Um, that's the really difficult part. Quite right to, to question the models. But it gives, at least it tells you a lot about what's really important. If you change this a little bit, that makes a big difference. If you change this bit, it doesn't change, make much difference. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so one of the things that you touched on was about um, uh, different solutions to current spread. So for example, lateral ball electrodes versus perimodial electrodes. Uh, and, and why do you think it doesn't make a difference um, you know, when, when we, I guess we expect it would theoretically? Um, well, it, it, it doesn't probably make a difference that much because if you look at some of the simulation we've done with monopolar, uh, the, the voltage profile across the lumen is pretty similar because uh, it's quite it's got a broad voltage profile. So where you put the electrode doesn't make a huge amount of difference uh, to, to the structures that are right next to it. Um, so it's, it's, if you're going to use different kinds of stimulation like the tripolar, then it becomes um, then, it, then it may become more more important. Um, so, I mean, there are there are some people now uh, like the um, five three two has got a I think publication out of Nashville showing um, that their perimodial has slightly better uh, performance than than their lateral wall electrode. Um, but um, I mean that's one one study. So there may be slight differences. You might be able to get better impedance uh, in that you know even though um, you might use, need slightly less current to stimulate perimodial than than lateral wall. Uh, even that's not clear, but I think it's basically the current spread issue that the, the current spread profile is so broad that where it sits in that narrow one millimeter range doesn't make a huge difference. Okay, great. Thank you. So, and we've got a question that's come through on the chat function. So, um, with the increasing presence of smartphones in our lives, is there any research looking into integrating 
uh, cochlear implants with iPhones. Is it? Yeah, I mean the smartphone. Uh, yeah. A lot of them do have uh, have uh, have connectivity to uh, to smartphones now, um, so you know you've got um, you know the cochlear device probably the, the best at this one. Uh, it's got you know built-in uh, Bluetooth connectivity to phones, so uh, you can um, I mean you can interrogate the implant through smartphones. People uh, in Texas, uh, a group of researchers have put out a smartphone application to actually directly interrogate you and program your 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 implant. Uh, there's the you know there's things like the the Fox strategy which which does um, remote testing and can even 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 um, do speech testing of your implant, uh, optimize it things like that. So people, there's more and more interaction between smartphones uh, and implants. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that, Prof. And probably it's time for another questions. So you talked about electrodes coming out from the cochlear after insertion. Uh, have you got a sense of how soon this occurs. I know in the video you showed it looked like it was pretty much immediate, but do you think this also happens later on? Uh, yeah, and that, that's one, one, I guess, one part of the question. The second thing is if you could just comment on the advantage of, you know, EFIs over uh, X-rays or cone beam CT uh, for detecting extracochlear electrodes. Yeah, a, a good question. Uh, so um, certainly they, I, they, a lot of them come out in the medial perioperative period uh, when they're not fixed in place. We've seen several where the EFI was normal, and we when we put it in, so we, we put the electrode in. We can see the 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 you know, blue marker or the white marker, depending on which electrode you used, that we're at the we're at the at the um, round window. Uh, we close up the skin, we repeat the EFI with Tim's, and it's different. So it's come out between us putting it in and closing up the skin. It's come out, uh, and we've had I think seven or eight cases now. We've just opened up, and sure enough, what the EFI or Tim's predicted was actually happening. Uh, the other thing we found is that um, if if a couple come out um, come out at the end of surgery, that electrode is unstable. Um, so sometimes um, um, you know it might be one out with something, and we say oh, we we'll just ignore it. Uh, I've been burned um, once or twice. Uh, when you come to the post op X ray, which is two or three weeks later, three or four are out because that was uh, start to uncoil and that wasn't a stable electrode. Uh, so I think it can come out over the first few weeks, uh, perhaps even later. But I think the perioperative period is is the most uh, it, it, between putting it in and closing, and between that and if if, if it comes out then, then it, then it's still at risk up to the up to the first few weeks as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, the advantage of EFI over over cone beam CT etc. Um, and Tim's. Uh, well, Tim's uh, and EFI have trouble just detecting one electrode out, to be honest, but more than one, they're pretty good. Uh, of course, you, you completely uh, avoid all the radiation, right? So, uh, so that's really important in children, for instance. Also, uh, Tim's or an EFI takes two minutes to do, so you don't have to do the, uh, the bring, you know, wheel the, um, uh, wheel the, uh, uh, the uh, machine into the operating room. Unless you have an interoperative cone beam CT, uh, I find the plane films are going to miss one to electrodes out anyway, uh, and uh, uh, so if you have interrupted cone beam, perhaps. But even with, if I find EFIs, to me honest, to me are more reliable than a than a regular CT scan with beam forming artifact because you get so much beam forming artifact unless you're using cone beam that it's difficult to tell if one to electrodes out even using that. And I guess the audiologists can also check it, for example, at switch on. They can, yeah. And for instance, the uh, Advanced Bionics has the AIMS tablet, AIM tablet, which uh, can do it, you know, with uh, interoperatively or postoperatively, and uh, cochlear in there. And the Soundwave uh, software has it built in as a Tim's uh, Tim's use. Have to uh, get most people don't use it because they're uncomfortable with it, don't know what it means. Um, mm -hmm. But it's actually pretty easy to use. Great, thanks so much, Prof. I think we've probably uh, come to time.